Um, like Megan, I too started in law and quit. Uh, <laughs> actually, I went to uh, Stanford down here. Is this on? Yeah? Working? Okay. So I went to Stanford, and uh, because I'm Asian American, as an Asian American in the middle of the 70s, um, your parents wanted you to be a doctor, lawyer, or dentist. And uh, I didn't want to stick my hand in people's mouths, so that threw out dentistry. I didn't want to stick my hand in people's bodies, so that threw out medicine. So all that was left was law. And so uh, to make my parents happy, I entered law school, and I lasted two weeks. So unlike me, and I figured it out earlier. Because <laughs> most people, actually, they, they practice law for 20 years, and they figure they don't like it. Um, you did it after get, passing the bar, and I did it after two weeks. So... Uh, just shows the two of us are inherently smarter than most lawyers, yeah. Uh, so a little bit about my background. I worked for Apple from 83 to 87. I was Apple's software evangelist, so it was my job to convince people to write Mac software. And after that, I started several software companies. I became a venture capitalist. I returned to Apple once, a second tour of duty, as they say. And uh, then I started Garage.com, which was a boutique investment bank, which is today uh, an early stage venture capitalist. And now I'm basically writing and speaking. Um, and I have this website called All Top where we uh, aggregate news by topics. So it's, it's kind of like many of the iPad readers, except it's not pretty, it's efficient. We have a, <laughs> on the spectrum of you know, pretty and efficient, we're on the efficient side of the, the spectrum. So uh, today I'm talking to you to, about my new book called Enchantment. Uh, I've watched high-tech speakers for about two and a half decades, and I noticed two things about them. Usually they suck, and they also go long, and that's a bad combination. You know, if you're good and you go long, it's okay. If you suck and you go short, it's okay. But if you suck and you go long, <laughs> it's like being stupid and arrogant, you know? So uh, I use top 10 format so that people can track progress through my speech. In case you think I suck, you know approximately how much longer I suck. So I gotta... This, this is a challenge when this happens because you know you don't have to know if you're laughing at me or you're laughing or you could be laughing at me because of that or laughing with me. Um, so my top ten about enchantment. Uh, this book came out about 90 days ago and it reflects my fascination with social psychology and the topic of influencing people and wooing people and persuading people. Uh, I became a big fan of a guy named Rob, Bob Cialdini who wrote a book called Influence which I highly recommend and also uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. So those are like the two cornerstones, uh, goals. And so I decided I wanted to write a book called Enchantment. Uh, I wanted to own a word, like if you're old enough, Tom Peters owns the word excellence and Jeffrey Moore owns the word chasm and Malcolm Gladwell owns tipping and outliers and blink. And so I wanted to find a word I could own. And so I decided it's gonna be enchantment that I'm gonna own. Um, so this is the speech. Uh, let me start off by saying that the cornerstone of great enchantment is that you have to achieve likability. Uh, very seldom do you get enchanted by someone you don't like. And so step one is to achieve likability. Uh, step one of step one is you have to have a great smile. This is not a great smile. This is what's called a Pan Am smile. Although I'm finding out that saying it's a Pan Am smile is not so effective because people are so young they don't know what Pan Am is anymore. <laughs> Do any of you realize that was an airline? Because, wow, I've, I've made speeches and people are like, what's Pan Am? And then I say, well, it's, and then I also use the analogy of Tom Peters' excellence, and lots of people are like, who's Tom Peters? So I'm feeling older and older every day. So anyway, uh, the Pan Am smile only uses the lower set of muscles, the jaw muscles. And this is a 50% effective smile. What you want is a great smile. And a great smile is called a Duchenne smile. A Duchenne smile uses two sets of muscles, the jaw and the eyes. Uh, in other words, you want crow's feet. Crow's feet is a good thing. <laughs> forget the Botox, forget the plastic surgery. Just think of all the money you saved already coming to this conference. You want crow's feet. This is an example of an excellent smile. This is Mary Smith, Facebook uh, consultant. And uh, she's a friend of mine. When I decided to use her picture, I sent her an email. I said, Mari, I have good news for you and bad news. The good news is you're in my enchantment presentation. I'll give this presentation 60, 70 times a year. Tens of thousands of people will learn about you. That's the good news. 
The bad news is you're in my presentation because you have crow's feet, Mary. What can I say? <laughs> so uh, she's a good sport. Let me use her picture. Make a Duchenne smile. Second component is to dress for a tie. I think there are three theories when you dress for meetings. The first is you could underdress. You know everybody will be semi-formal, business attire, but you decide just to be different, you're going to wear a t-shirt and jeans. You're telling the audience, I don't respect you. You can also overdress. You're telling the audience, I'm richer than you, I have better taste than you, I am better than you. What you want to do is dress as a peer, roughly equal to the audience. Of course, I don't see anybody wearing an Aloha shirt here today, but you get the concept, equal dressing. Next thing is to develop a great handshake. This is the formula for the perfect handshake. Um, I could stay here for a while while you copy it down, uh, or I'll be, I'll be happy to send you PDFs at the end of the presentation. The point here is that you have to make eye contact, you have to have a firm grip, your hand can't be too wet, can't be too strong, don't, not too far away, uh, not too vigorous, not too long, not too short. But you need to have a good handshake. So now, We've built the basis of likability. Great smile, matching dress, and a perfect handshake. We need to go and look at a great example. This is a great example of likability. This is Richard Branson. At this moment, we are in Moscow, and he had just asked me if I flew Virgin, and I said I never fly Virgin because I'm a United Airlines Global Services customer. And as Global Services, uh, you're at the high. And at that moment, he got down on his knees and he started polishing my shoes with his jacket. And so this is the very moment I started flying Virgin America. <laughs> uh, and you know, by contrast, if you think that Steve Jobs will get on his knees and polish your shoes so that you use a Macintosh, don't hold your breath. <laughs> okay? It's not going to happen. He's a great example of likability. The next step is that even though you're likable, you may not be trusted. And if you think about it, you can like somebody but not trust them. For example, you could like Charlie Sheen but not trust Charlie Sheen. So the next step is to achieve trustworthiness. Uh, the first step in that is that you have to trust others before you can expect that they will trust you. Glamour.com it enables you to buy a Kindle ebook. You have one week before it really sticks in terms of a purchase. For the first week, you could send back that Kindle ebook. Many people. Could Read the ebook in that period. Amazon trusts you. It gives you a week to return it. Second example, Zappos. If Tony Shea had said to me, my business model is I'm going to enable women to buy shoes without trying it on, I would have told him he's nuts. That no woman would buy a shoe without trying it on. And yet, millions of women do that. Believe me, I know. <laughs> There's a steady stream of boxes into our house. And the most amazing thing is that women have completely trusted uh, Zappos, right? They're, they're completely comfortable with it. A lot of it has to do with Zappos paying shipping both ways. But Zappos clearly trusted women, and women now trust Zappos. If Zappos said, well, someday if we're successful, it would have never achieved its success. And the last example is a classic example, Nordstrom. Great example, brick and mortar store that trusts everyone. So step one is to trust others. If you want to be trusted, you have to trust others first. Step two is to become a baker, not an eater. A baker sees the world as not a zero-sum game. An eater sees the world as a zero-sum game. An eater says, this is a limited pie. What I eat, somebody else doesn't eat. What somebody else eats, I don't eat. I need to eat as much as I can. A baker sees the world as, I can bake more pies, and I can bake bigger pies. The rising tide can float all boats. Bakers are trustworthy. And the last point is to always default to yes. That is, as you meet people, always be thinking, how can I help the other person? And you'll be much more trustworthy. After building this path of trustworthiness, now we need to perfect, to get ready to launch our product or service. First thing you need to do is to find the qualities of great products or services. You know, I've tried to enchant people with crap, and I've tried to enchant people with great stuff. It is much easier to enchant people with great stuff. So this is a roadmap for creating great stuff. First thing, great stuff is deep, lots of functionality, lots of features. People don't run out of power as they use great stuff. They are also intelligent. When you look at it, you can say to yourself, wow, this company thought out what I needed, understood my problem, provided a great solution. 
This is a Ford Mustang GT500. 550 horsepower, 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds. This is really to 5.5 Priuses. Okay? I want to buy this car because I'm going through a midlife crisis. I'm having all these issues. And so, you know, Asian American man, this is the car. Okay? <laughs> And yet, I have four children, uh, six, nine, 15, and 17. The 17 year old has a license, the 15 year old is in the permit process. And I know no matter how well we plan it, there will be a time where they're gonna have to drive dad's car. And the thought of them driving a 550 horsepower car is frightening to me. I mean, it was, it's just not fair to the people of Menlo Park, California, <laughs> that these two teenage boys might be in this car. So. That makes me hesitate, but I figured out that Ford makes a very intelligent product. The intelligent product is called MyKey. And what the MyKey enables you to do is program the top speed of the car into the key. So I could loan them the car with this key set to a top speed of 55 miles an hour. <laughs> it doesn't control how fast or how long it takes to get to 55 but it controls that you cannot go faster than 55. I think that is an extreme intelligent C stands for completeness. Great products are complete. It's not just the software. It's the software, the documentation, the string of enhancements, the webinars, the total infrastructure about it, the total ecosystem about it. Great products are also empowering. They make you feel more creative, more productive. Um, they become an extension of yourself. And the last quality of great products are that they are elegant. Someone cared about the user interface. So if you want to create an enchanting product, service, or website, ask yourself, is it deep? Is it intelligent? Is it complete? Is it empowering? And is it elegant? Are you rolling the dicey? The next thing is to be able to describe your product or service in short, sweet, and swallowable terms. This is an ad of a example of an ad that is short, sweet, and swallowable. It was created right after 9-11 for the metro system of New York, where they were trying to build awareness for you know, potential bombs <laughs> left on top on the, on the buses and on the uh, subway. So all it says is, if you see something, say something. It's that simple. I think many organizations should create mantras for themselves as opposed to mission statements. Mission statements are usually 50 or 60 words long. It's because 50 or 60 people from the company went to this offsite. They each figured they're entitled to one word in the mission statement since they spent two days at this offsite. Mantras are two or three words. The mantra, for example, for Nike could be just not just do it, that's their slogan, but authentic athletic performance. The mantra for eBay would be to democratize commerce. The mantra for uh, Target would be democratize design. So it's those kinds of words. Uh, the, the, the mantra for Wendy's could be healthy, fast food. Somewhat oxymoronic, but healthy, fast food. Short, sweet, and swallowable. And the last thing, or the last example here for this point is, this is a picture of a sign that I photographed that explains how to cross a street. This is the antithesis of short, sweet, and swallowable. This sign is on the campus of Brown University. Two days later, I was taking the 17 and the 15 year old on a college tour. Two days later, there's something about the Ivy League. <laughs> Ivy League needs this sign. I don't know what it is. You don't see the sign at Stanford. Um, that's what it takes. The next thing is to conduct a pre mortem. You want me to go back a slide? Yeah. <laughs> I can send you the original <laughs> JPEG. <laughs> Okay, uh, the next thing is to conduct a pre-mortem. So this is, if you're involved in a project, many times in a meeting, the leader of the project will say, does anybody have any concerns or questions? And usually nobody says anything. And the reason why nobody says anything is because if you say something, if you ask, you know, why is the software so late? Why is it so slow? Why is it so buggy? That person who asked that question is making an enemy, right? If you're the market person that says, I think the software is too buggy to ship, you just drew a big bullseye on your chest. The engineering manager hates your guts. You're seen as a naysayer, a laggard, a non-team player. All this negative stuff happens. And you say, all right, you know, I'm not going to say anything. Ship that piece of crap. I suggest a different way. A different way is called a pre-mortem. And so what the leader has to say is, 
let's pretend that the product failed. Pretend that it failed. Now, let's come up with all the reasons why it failed. Software too slow. Salesforce is too, unsophist is too unsophisticated. Marketing mispositioned it. Microsoft introduced a competing product and gave it away for free. Come up with all the list of reasons why the product failed, and then let's go through that list of reasons and eliminate as many of those reasons as possible so that we never have to do a post-mortem. So go through, the, go through the exercise of pretending that the thing failed and come up with the reasons why it failed, and then eliminate those reasons. Conduct a pre-mortem. The next step is to launch your product or service. A great story. Tell a great story. You and your buddy, you were frustrated because the only place you could use a computer was by going to a large company or a library or a government agency. You, you wanted your own computer. You wanted a computer in your house. You wanted a computer small enough to carry. So you started Apple, right? Or you were frustrated with search results. And you thought there must be a better way to find out you know, the top results for search. And we, think, we figured out, oh, maybe the number of inbound links to the site is an indication of quality. So we started Google. Or we, had a, we, did, we wanted to share video better. There was really no great way to share video, so we started YouTube. Or my fiance wanted to sell Pez dispensers from her collection, and there was no way to do this on the internet, so we started eBay. Oh, that's a bullshit story, but it is a great story. <laughs> Tell a story. The next point is to plant many seeds. I think there are two kinds of marketing right now. It's marketing 1.0, marketing 2.0. Marketing 1.0 is top down. You find the, the, the major analysts, you find the major journalists, you find the person with 10 million followers who works for the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, whatever. You suck up to that person. If you can't do the sucking up yourself, you hire a PR firm to do the sucking up for you. You suck up to the firm, you hope that they like your product, they tell the unwashed masses, use this product. So the analyst, the expert, you know, makes the product. Marketing 2.0, because of Facebook and Twitter, has flattened that world. And now, I think nobodies are the new somebodies. So the key to introducing a product is that regular people, Lonely Boy 15, and if Lonely Boy 15 spreads it to his 15 followers, and they spread it to their 15 followers, one day you may wake up with a huge success. And at that point, all the candidates have to cover you. Because if they don't cover you, they look clueless. I think that's how the world works. It's not top down anymore. It's Lonely Boy 15. The problem with the theory of Lonely Boy 15 is how do you find Lonely Boy 15? Because he only has 15 followers. He doesn't work for the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNET, Wired. You have to plant many seeds. It is a big numbers game. This means you have to think about your product from the start plant many seeds with this product? How can we get the demo unit out there? How can we make it so it's easy to try to easily convert existing data? All these things have to kick in. You know, when Enchantment came out, typically you send about 150 copies out to reviewers. I sent out 1,600. I sent out roughly 10 times. Basically, any blogger who wanted it got it. I didn't care if they blogged about beauty, books, I have reviews now from dog trainer blogs, vegetarian blogs, and I own the esthetician blog market. I don't know why. <laughs> so lots of women like to write about mascara and makeup, and then they got enchantment, and they wrote about enchantment, inner beauty. Hallelujah, you know. To use the old argument, imagine if 1% of the women who are interested in beauty bought this book. <laughs> That's a huge number. Plant many seeds. Next thing is to use salient points. On the left side, you see how the industry likes to, de to describe something. Cars, talk about miles per gallon. What people really care about is, you know, most people drive 12,000 miles a year. How much am I going to spend on gas in that year? It's not the miles per gallon. It's how much am I going to spend on gas? Next salient point. If you're in a non-for-profit business, many, many non-for-profits discuss things in terms of dollars. What they should discuss is if you give $100, it buys six months of food for a family in Guatemala. It's the number of months of food that you're paying for. It's not the dollars that people care about. And in the gadget business, people don't wake up in the morning saying, oh, if only I had another 16 gigabytes, I'd be a happy camper. They wake up asking, how many songs can I put on my iPod? How many movies? How many books? Is there an app for that? That's what they're thinking about. So use the kind of parameters on the right side 
not the stuff on the left side. Use the salient points. The next thing is to overcome resistance to your enchantment. This is an example. In the mid 80s, gaming business was tarnished, so retailers did not want to stock games for Christmas. Nintendo realized it had a problem, so what it did is it added a robot to its game and repositioned it not as a game, but as a toy. In fact, it was an educational toy, because if you bought this thing, you learned robotics. It was an educational toy. It told kids, ask your parents for an educational toy for Christmas to learn robotics which is very different than asking for an electronic game. That's how it broke down resistance. More ways, provide social proof. Provide visi visible ways where it's obvious that people are using your product or service. I think Apple did this by accident. It sold iPods with white earbuds. And you notice people having white earbuds because nobody else had white earbuds. No other product sold it that way. And as you notice white earbuds, you became convinced that wow, that must be successful must be popular, so you bought an iPod. Now there was one more white earbud in the world for other people to see, and it became this tremendous upward spiral. The more white earbuds you saw, the more iPods were bought, the more iPods were bought, the more white earbuds you saw, the more iPods were bought. Wonderful, wonderful upward spiral. Provide social proof. Next thing is to provide or find a, a bright spot. So when you introduce something, you'll see that many people are going to reject what you do. And there's a temptation to try to overcome the resistance. I think the better way to do it is to find that soul or maybe handful of bright spots where you are successful. First, an analog example. Um, somebody tried to fight malnutrition in Vietnam. And rather than trying to overcome all the negative parts of malnutrition in Vietnam, he focused on the bright spot. The bright spot was that in every family, there were only a few families much healthier he wanted to know why these families had healthier kids. The answer was the moms of those families were adding shrimps and crab and vegetable matter from the rice patties to the plain rice meals. That's the only thing they did differently. That was the bright spot. He focused on the bright spot and fought malnutrition. In a digital world, in the mid 80s, Apple was unsuccessful with Macintosh. We tried to position it in a spreadsheet database and a word processing machine. We were zero for three there. The bright spot, the bright spot was desktop publishing. PageMaker saved Apple. If it wasn't for PageMaker, we wouldn't have iPhones today. We'd all have phones with real keypads. Battery would last for more than a day. We wouldn't be stuck with the crappiest data network. It would be an entirely different world, right? All this PageMaker was a bright spot that saved Apple. If no PageMaker, Apple would have died. All this PageMaker was a gift from God to Apple. I believe in God. One of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence <laughs> of a benevolent God. Find the bright spot. Don't focus on overcoming the dim spots. Find the bright spot. The next thing is to enchant all the influencers. Many people make a decision up front who they have to enchant, who they have to influence. Many people default to the dad. That would be wrong in 80% of the time. It's really the mom that makes the call. Sometimes it's the sister-in-law. Sometimes it's the grandfather. In my family, it's the daughter. It's the daughter. You influence my daughter, you got me. Um, so the key point here is you have to enchant all the influencers. And, and as a venture capitalist, I get asked all the time, could I introduce this company to CIO, CTO, CMO, CXO of a company, right? So they want, to, they want to be introduced to this company. They want to be introduced to Jeff Bezos because they just raised a million dollars and now they're going to have this magical new server architecture. And so they want me to call up Jeff Bezos to give them appointments. They can convince Jeff Bezos to throw out the entire infrastructure of Amazon based on them having just raised a million dollars and not shipped the server yet. Okay? So I'll tell you something. In most organizations, the higher you go, the thinner the air. And the thinner the air, the more difficult it is to support intelligent life. So if you focus on CXO level people in, in an organization, you will be dealing with the dumbest, most political people. You need to work with the middles and the bottoms because that's where the real work and the real intelligence exists. Enchant all the influencers. And while I'm on the subject of my daughter, I'm going to tell you something. If you want to learn about marketing, you truly want to learn about marketing, suspend your disbelief, trust me, 
and rent or buy the movie Never Say Never, the Justin Bieber movie. How many of you have seen that movie? How many? Just one? Oh, and you call yourselves marketers? Two. So, was that not a great movie? It is a truly great movie. You'll learn more about marketing in that movie than almost any movie you could see. You'll learn, first of all, that social media made Justin Bieber. It was his mother and YouTube. It wasn't because Disney put, you know, a hundred million dollars behind Justin Bieber. It was YouTube and his mother. Okay, that's number one. Second, why are you shaking your head? Okay, secondly, <laughs> secondly, you will see how hard he works. God, he works hard. I was amazed. I thought I work hard. I mean, you know, I make, I make 50 to 75 speeches a year. He was on an 86 stop tour in just in that movie. And going on a bus, I mean, if you want to see a great relationship between a mentor and a mentee, watch how he interacts with his vocal coach. Very interesting, very interesting relationship. Um, and talk about word of mouth and, and engaging people. He has his staff go into the uh, parking lots of his concerts and finds girls who don't have tickets and gives girls tickets. And you should see the pure joy that those tickets bring to those girls in the parking lot. It is truly, truly heartwarming. And so, on many, many parameters, now you could learn a lot about marketing. And you know, if, if you're still doubting me, I'll give you two tips. One is, ask yourself, do you work for an organization that controls your target market the way Justin Bieber does. I doubt it. <laughs> Not even Apple can say that, right? So there is something to learn there. And if you don't, if you see the movie or rent the movie and buy the movie and, and you feel like it wasn't worth the money, I'll give you the money back. I'll give you a money back guarantee on renting or buying Justin Bieber's Never. I've seen the movie, I've been to two of his concerts. I love hockey, I hate to admit this. I just went to one on this week. I, I really love hockey, but I have been to more Justin Bieber concerts than hockey games this year. <laughs> the sixth thing, the sixth thing is that you need to make your enchantment endure. Uh, one great example, going from Justin Bieber to the Grateful Dead, is that the Grateful Dead has endured for decades. And one of the ways it endures is because it creates an area at its concerts for what it calls tape anymore and what it does is it enables people to basically pirate the music it creates an area where it says record our concert here and then you can share the music so you know compared to what compared to the rest of the RIAA they're suing little for, you know, downloading hello music on Napster but but the Grateful Dead is telling you come to our concert and tape the music how amazing is that one of the reasons why the Grateful Dead has endured. Next, build an ecosystem. As I said in the completeness part of Dicey, you know, great software has consultants, developers, retailers, user groups, websites, blogs, online special interest groups, and con uh, conferences. It's not just the software. A great book would have not just the book, but it would have a Facebook fan page. It would have book clubs would have um, a workbook on how to implement the, the, the concepts of the book. Build this ecosystem. You want lots of people pulling for you. You want lots of people trying to add value to you. The next thing is to invoke reciprocation. This is a carpet that depicts the war between Italy and Ethiopia. Italy invaded Ethiopia in the 1930s. When that happened, the people of Mexico contributed money and sent money to the people of Ethiopia to fight the Italians. Ninety years later, there was a big earthquake in Mexico, and even though the people in Ethiopia were in the middle of a famine, they collected money and sent money back to Mexico. That's how strong reciprocation is. Another example like this, right after the Civil War, the people of the North bought the people of Charleston a fire truck because they heard that the people of Charleston were using a bucket brigade. They actually had to buy them two fire trucks because the first one was on a ship that sank. So then what it did is the people of Charleston felt a very powerful need to reciprocate. And so they said if the people of New York ever needed our help, we would reciprocate. All right. Fast forward to 9-11, the people of Charleston raised half a million dollars 
and bought a fire truck for the people of New York to reciprocate 150 years later. That's how strong reciprocation is. Two power tips about reciprocation that I learned from Bob Cialdini. First, if you are defaulting to yes, if you are a baker who's trying to make the world a better, bigger place, inevitably you'll do things for people and they will help you. When they help you and they thank you, I mean, when you help them and they thank you, I'll tell you the optimal response when someone thanks you. The optimal response is, I know you would do the same for me. Which is to say, I'm telling Megan, I think she has class, she's a good person, I know you'll do the same for me. I'm also telling her, I know you will do the same for me. <laughs> okay? You're putting her on notice. You don't have to do this every time, but you know, let's, I know you'll do the same for me. Second thing is, Second power tip, enable people to pay back. You may think you want to take the high, high road, which is, I know you would do the same for me, but you don't have to. That is not optimal. It's not optimal for either of you, because even though you say that, she still feels indebted to you. She feels indebted to you, so she might not ask you to do something else, which you would be perfectly happy to do. So your relationship stalls out. She doesn't want to ask you to do anything more. What you have to do is you have to enable her to clear the deck. You have to say, this is what you can do for me. By enabling her to pay me back, another transaction has occurred, stronger relationship. And then, now that the deck's cleared, she can ask me to do more, I can do more, more things going on between us. So enable people to pay you back. It's, it's good for you, it's good for the other person. Invoke reciprocation. The next thing is, my advice, don't rely on money to enchant people. You want to be likable, you want to be trustworthy, you want to have a great service. But if you believe that it takes a commission or an affiliate fee to have a good relationship, something is wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay people, but if you have to rely on money, something is missing from your enchantment. Money is typically the enemy of enchantment. If you're the person receiving the money, at some level you have to ask yourself, am I doing this because I'm getting money or because I really believe? If you're the people receiving the enchantment, at some point you're going to ask, am I being told to use this Macintosh, this iPod, iPod, iPad, whatever, iPhone? Is it because the person truly believes in the quality of those products or because the person has getting an affiliate fee from Apple? You know, what's that person's true motivation? Don't rely on money. The seventh thing is that great enchanters are great speakers. First thing, customize your introduction when you begin a speech. Somehow customize it. Tell a story about how you quit law school, just like the host. Somehow customize it. This is a picture of my LG washer and dryer. I bought this LG washer and dryer because I was totally fascinated that the washer has a steam cycle. I've owned this washer for two years. I've never used a steam cycle. I still don't know when you would use I really cannot figure when you would use a steam cycle. Because at our house, either the clothes are filthy or they're completely clean. There's nothing in between where you would use just steam. So I don't know when you use steam, but I thought that was so cool I bought this washer and dryer. So I was in uh, Brazil speaking to the Latin American management of LG. So I thought, you know, I was in Brazil already. I thought, God, you're so stupid. You should have taken a picture of your LG washer and dryer. That way you can customize the introduction. You could stand up in front of all these people at LG and say, I'm a customer, I'm an LG customer. Look, this is my washer and dryer. But I hadn't done that. I was in Brazil, so I sent a text message to my two older boys, Nick and Noah. And I tell them, go downstairs. Stop playing Call of Duty for a second. <laughs> go downstairs. Use the iPhone 4 that dad bought you. You know, try to invoke a little reciprocation here, boys. Go downstairs. Take a picture. I need the picture right away. I'm about to go on deck. Send me a picture of the washer and dryer. I wait 20 minutes. Nothing happens. So I send a text message to my older son, Nick. Basically, did you get my text messages? Nick answers, Noah his, younger brother. Noah, his younger brother said, he did it. He sent you the pictures. By the way, since you're speaking to LG, can you get us TVs? You know, because we're tired of playing Call of Duty and Halo on these old TVs. We want a 60 inch high definition flat panel TV. So dad, can you get us TVs? You see my answer, I doubt it. Because there's reciprocation, there is stupidity, okay? So, 
When I speak in other countries, I try to go early. I try to take pictures in the country. I'll show you some pictures that I use to open up speeches in other countries. Um, this is a picture that I used in Moscow uh, when I was there with Richard Branson to make a speech. I learned Russians truly have big balls. That is. Um, this is a picture in Edinburgh at Crombie's where I learned about the delicacy called haggis, which, oh, God, that is disgusting. That, you know, what I do is... Uh, I'm a big fan of bizarre foods with Andrew Zimmern. And so wherever he goes, I go. So, you know, he goes to Chile and eats guinea pigs. I go to the same place, eat guinea pigs. Whatever he does, I'll do. So uh, I do not recommend this. Um, I mean, this haggis. I do recommend visiting this place, though. Um, this is me standing in front of uh, Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is a very interesting place. Al Jazeera, you know, I, I just got back from Doha uh, in Qatar. And, I was so wrong about the whole, I mean, like I was afraid to go to Qatar and that was like such a ridiculous thing. And you know, I think a lot of Americans think that everybody in the Mideast is trying to kill us. It's just not true. And you know, I think a lot of people think that Al Jazeera is like this news service that terrorists run. And it's not at all true. I mean, they are very cool people, max all over the place, big into social media. They want to show both sides. You know, they're like the opposite of Fox. Okay, so um, I love the Al Jazeera. If you ever get a chance to go to Doha or Qatar, go. I mean, it is really, really interesting place. I really enjoyed it. And uh, this is my favorite picture showing how you can customize an introduction. I showed this picture when I spoke in Istanbul. Uh, this is me in the Grand Bazaar trying on a fez. And I mean, just look at that smile. That, that is truly a Duchenne smile, you know? So these are the kinds of pictures. The point is, customize your introduction. Second point is, sell your dream. When you make a presentation, if you're Steve Jobs, you don't stand up in front of an audience and say, I have an iPhone 5. iPhone 5 is $188 worth of parts. We assemble these parts in China at a company where we're doing everything we can to prevent so many suicides. We also stick you with a two-year data package with the lousiest carrier in America. You know, that's not how he positions iPhone. Okay, he positions iPhone as cool and thin, and there's an app for that. It makes you more productive, more creative. He sells his dream for this $180 worth of parts. Sell your dream. And the last part of great presentation is the Guy Kawasaki 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint, which is the optimal number of slides in PowerPoint presentation is 10, 10. You'd be lucky to get 10 points across. Now, some of you may be skeptical and be saying, God, you're such a hypocrite. You've already used 40. Why are you telling us to use 10 and you use 40 already? You're not even finished. The answer to that is, you're not me. <laughs> 10 slides. <laughs> 10 slides. 10 slides. You should be able to give these 10 slides in 20 minutes. You may have a one hour slot. But you know what? 95% of the world is using another operating system. That operating system needs 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. Okay? 10 slides, 20 minutes. And the optimal font size is 30 points. Not 10. Many people use 10. That's what 10 points look like. You can't read it. 10 points. People use 10 points because they need to put a lot of text and they want to read the text. The problem with reading text on a presentation is that one slide into your presentation, the audience figures out you're a clown who's reading the text verbatim. And they figure out, well, this clown is reading the text verbatim. Frankly, you can read silently to yourself faster than that clown can read it out loud. So you could just read the slides. You don't need him. If you find this rule too dogmatic, the optimal font size generally take the oldest person in the audience, divide his or her age by two. So you're presenting to year old people, 30 point font. 50 year old people, 25 point font. God bless you. Someday you may be pitching to a really young VC, 16 years old. But until that point, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. The eighth thing is how to use technology to advance people. Step number one, a step that many people get wrong, is remove the speed bump to your technology. This is CAPTCHA. The purpose of CAPTCHA, as we all know, is to reduce the number of people who use Okay? So, the first word is probably Holber. It's the second word that, that might prevent registration at your site. That second word, who knows what that second word is? Who even knows what language that is? An irony of ironies. 
That's the Hebrew word for obstacle. <laughs> obstacle. I'll show you an anti-speed bump example. A company called Sungevity. Sungevity is in the business of putting in solar panels. One of the speed bumps in putting in a solar panel on your roof is you have to make an appointment. They come out, they estimate, they take a reading, and all that stuff. Pay the gas. You have to be home, all this stuff. So what Sungevity does is it asks you for the home address, and then it uses the Bing satellite photo system, looks up your house, gets the top-down view, and mocks up what your house would look like with solar panels on the roof. From this, they can calculate how much those solar panels will cost and how much power they could create. This is a picture of my house mocked up with a solar panel. I didn't have to be there. I didn't have to make an appointment. All I did is give them my home address. That's removing a big speed bump to putting something in. The next thing is you know, what you should do with social media. I think that the, the key to success in social media is one of three things. You have to provide information. What just happened? This is a story that you might not have found before. Provide links. If you look at my Twitter account, 90% are links. And if you looked at my Twitter account, you see that I tweet about 75 times a day, um, which is kind of amazing. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how that's done. Um, I have, believe it or not, roughly 20 people who are contributing to my Twitter account. So they are looking for stories, they summarize the story to a website called Holy Cow. The Holy Cow headline automatically becomes a tweet. Okay? So in a sense, there are 20 smart looking for great information on my behalf. Now, some of you will be saying, well, guy, that means you're engaging, you're not personal, you're not breaking all these rules of social media. First of all, there are no rules of social media. The rule of social media, the only rule of social media you should care about is, if it works for me, do it. That's the rule. For me, it works. I consider myself, my Twitter account in particular, a fire hose. It's a fire hose that's finding interesting information. And just FYI, because when I tell people I have 20 contributors, lots of people freak out. Just so you know, they only tweet out links. If you at me or mention me or direct me, only I answer. So there are no ghosts answering as me. Only I answer. But in the broadcast mode, like if you looked at at Mashable or at New York Times, it's pure broadcast, right? Try writing to Pete Cashmore at, at Mashable and say, hey, Pete, you know, what's up in Scotland? See if he responds, okay? I will. So I broadcast with the 20 contributors, but I also respond personally. Um, I have a tip for you. Look at a new application called Hibari, H-I-B-A-R-I. -A -A uh, I think it is, for what I need to do, it is the best Twitter client I have found. Because what Hibari enables you to do really well is see a lot of tweets in a limited space. Um, you know, one of the beauties of TweetDeck is that you can have these global filters and you can subtract stuff and all that. But TweetDeck, they have this, this concept that all tweets are the same size. So even if you have a small tweet versus a big tweet, they take the same amount of vertical space. So in TweetDeck, on my MacBook Pro, I can see about four tweets. On Hibari, I can see about eight. And so being able to see twice as many tweets is very valuable to me. And what Hibari allows you to do is you can block keywords and you can also silence people. So the kind of keywords that I block are, I block everything that has an RT in it. Because when someone retweets me, I don't need to see that tweet. It's flattering, I like to know that it's happening but I don't really need to do anything. So I block the RTs, I block the vias, I block the follow Fridays, I block all that kind of stuff because um, I don't need to see those things. And there are about 20 people who I consider either idiots or bots and I silence them. I don't need to ever see them because they're repeating everything I do or they repeatedly attack me and I don't want them to upset my karma as I look at you know my Twitter stream. So I block them. So I, I have a very pure stream of what I need to see, and that's all possible with Hibari, H-I-B-A-R-I. -I. Mac only, you're on a Windows, you suck. I mean, what can I say? So uh, provide information. Secondly, provide insights. If you're not providing links, provide insights into what news means. You know, if, 
If Amazon ships a new iPhone app that you can be in a store and you snap a picture of a barcode of a product and it goes up, it takes the barcode, looks up the price in Amazon, sends you a message what this would cost in Amazon. That's a very cool app, right? What does that mean? Does this mean the end of retailing? Will everybody be doing this in a store? No one will ever buy something at a store anymore? Or does it mean that people want immediate gratification? So even though you could find out what Amazon's selling it for, you'll still buy it. And what's the insights into the availability of that app? And the last thing is assistance. How do you get that app? How do you avoid that app? If you're a retailer, how do you overcome that app? Information, insights, or assistance. Not my dog rolled over. Because many people do that. My dog rolled over. If you're a celebrity, arguably you could get away with that. You know, if, if Arnold Schwarzenegger, well, I would, let's not go into here. Yeah, like, yeah, if he said, yeah, well, the maid did a great job of cleaning our house today. That's not what you want. Um, or if Lance Armstrong says, I hate French food. You know, that'd be interesting. And Lance Armstrong says, my bike was stolen in Paris. That would be interesting too. But, you know, if we said that, who cares, right? Information, insights, and assistance. Next thing is some rules of engagement. I think one of the best ways to enchant people with technology is answer your email within 48 hours. Because nobody does that. Nobody. I do that, right? Nobody does that. I, I spend hours every day trying to answer email. I have people who are trying to help me answer email. I, have so, I put so much effort into answering email. I still can't achieve this, but I know this is the most important thing. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten an email from people saying, I never expected you to respond, which kind of pisses me off to tell you the truth, because if you never expected me to respond, why did you ask me the question? But I never say that. I take the high road, trying to be an enchanting guy, but respond fast. You also need to respond many, which is, if Rosenberg from the Wall Street Journal writes to you, of course you answer. You're sucking up to the Wall Street Journal. You want to be in his Thursday column. Duh. But what happens if boy 15 writes to you? That's the test. If you're planting many seeds, you better get used to it. Lonely boy 15 deserves an answer to his direct message or his email. And, you know, I keep mentioning lonely boy 15 as this generic, you know, nobody who's a somebody. So one day, three weeks ago, literally, lonely underscore boy underscore 15 at Twitter wrote to me. He really does exist. And the last thing is you have to engage often. That email not something you do when everything else is done. For me, it's core to my existence. Um, that's the core of my existence, and everything else is, is off to the side. Uh, many people have a completely opposite view. They view the core as something else, and if they have time, they answer email. If they have time, they tweet. If they have time, they Facebook update. I'm just the opposite. That's the core of my existence. The next thing is how to enchant your boss, if you have a boss. <laughs> The key to enchanting your boss is very simple, albeit painful. When your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. That's how you set the priority. It might not seem optimal, might not seem pleasant. I'm not telling you it is. I'm telling you this is what works. Your boss asks you to do something, drop everything else. If she tells you she needs a PowerPoint presentation in three days, drop everything else. Step two, prototype fast. She needs a PowerPoint presentation in three days. Three hours later, show up with an all text version saying, is this taking the right direction? This has two very positive effects. First, it shows that you have dropped everything, right? It's proof. This person is already prototyping and has dropped everything. Secondly, it gives you more time to fix the presentation or fix whatever you're doing for the person to ensure higher quality. This is the text file that I sent to the designer of this presentation. So that's what I did. I said, this is the text. You make it beautiful. Okay? And the last thing is always deliver bad news early. The worst thing in the world you could do is have this, this sort of wishful thinking that you know something bad is going to happen. I'm not going to tell the boss to the very last minute. Maybe a miracle will occur. The miracle never occurs. Deliver bad news early. The earlier you deliver it, the better. There's more chance to fix it before it truly does happen. Then how do you enchant down? Key to enchanting down, I stole from Daniel Pink. It's to provide a map. The map stands for, first, mastery. You come work for me, you will master new skills. You'll master social media. You'll become a better employee because you're going to gain more skills. Your mastery. 
You'll also be working autonomously. I'm not going to micromanage you and breathe down your neck. And finally, you'll be mastering new skills, working autonomously towards a higher purpose. We're not just trying to make a buck. We're trying to empower people. We're trying to make people more creative, more productive. We're trying to change the world. That's why you come work for me. Yes, you should pay them recently, but if you really want to enchant your employees as opposed to just employ your employees, provide them an ability to master new skills, working autonomously towards a higher purpose. Second thing is you empower action. You tell your employees, I have confidence in your decision making, your intelligence. I empower you to do what's right for the customer. And the third thing is, you suck it up. <laughs> suck it up means you're like micro of dirty jobs. The beauty of micro of dirty jobs is he is willing to suck it up. He works in the poi factory, the paint factory, changes high tension wires, goes underneath the house and gets the dead rat. He'll do the artificial insemination thing. He'll do whatever. He'll stick his hand in cows, pulls out calves. He'll do whatever it takes. He does the dirty job, right? So you need to be a boss that is willing to do the dirty job. That is to do whatever it takes, to suck it up. And never ask an employee to do something that you yourself would not do. Suck it up. Last story for you. Oh, I forgot, you know, how long did I have? I'm fine? Yep. Okay. So, I ran a crowdsourced, because I love crowdsourcing stuff. I ran a crowdsourced contest for the cover of my book. This is the one that won. And I love this. I showed this to my publisher. My publisher hated it. Too feminine, too self help, too woo woo, too Marin County, Bowler, Colorado, Shirley MacLaine, multiple lives. No man would buy this book. I was deeply disappointed. I saw their point, however. So I thought, I still want a blue butterfly. I want the, you know, the metaphor of changing to blooming to becoming a butterfly from a caterpillar. So because I'm Japanese, I thought, oh, origami. Not that I knew jack about origami. But I know how to use Google. So I type in origami butterfly, and I come across this. This is the Kawasaki swallowtail. I saw this, and I said, wow, this guy can really make butterflies. I should contact this guy. So the person who made this is a gentleman named Michael LaFosse. Basically, he's the Wayne Gretzky of origami, if you will. So I call him up, or I, I emailed him. I said, Michael, I need a butterfly. I want a blue butterfly. And it has to be a badass butterfly, not a feminine-looking butterfly, not a self-help-looking butterfly. It's a badass butterfly. Think blue morpho butterfly has sex with B2 stealth bomber. What would that <laughs> butterfly look like? And he came up with this. So this is the Kawasaki swallowtail. This is the butterfly that's on the cover. Um, you know, have you ever heard of a job swallowtail, Zuckerberg swallowtail, Ellison swallowtail, Gate swallowtail, Bomber swallowtail? I don't think so. I'm going to cross it off the bucket list. I have a butterfly named after me. This is the Kawasaki swallowtail. This is the cover of the book that you have. So that's how we went from blue morpho, self-help, feminine, Marin County, Boulder, Colorado butterfly to the B2 stealth, badass, blue morpho butterfly. And then one more thing, if we have time, I have time, I don't know if you have time because I don't know what's next, but I'll be happy to autograph your book. Several things about my autographing of the book. First, I autograph the outside. I autograph the outside for several reasons. First of all, it's faster. <laughs> Secondly, to me, the, way, the reason why you get a book autograph is you want to show off that you met the author. So why would you have it autographed on the inside? Nobody can see that there. Put on a cover, you know, then when you're like flying around someplace reading the book, somebody says, oh, Guy Kawasaki said you're irresistible. How cool is that? So you want to show that? It's like if you hit it big and you're going to buy a Ferrari, for crying out loud, buy a red one, right? You don't buy a white Ferrari. You're gonna, if you're going to buy a Ferrari, go for it, right? Put it on the outside. Third thing is, um, I have this standing offer so that anybody who has the book, they can just give me their address and I will sign a cover and just send them the cover so they can swap out covers, which hundreds of people have done. And I wish I could tell you I had this all planned and I, you know, I said to the cover designer, I need a large space where I can sign it. None of that occurred, okay? It's all this happened afterwards. And so people were, people were, I know some authors like Gretchen Rubin of The Happiness Project. She said, yeah, you know, what I do is, People want my autograph, I sign a book plate and then I mail them the book plate. But you know, a book plate looks like a book plate. It's something that you paste it in, right? So I, I, so I told Gretchen, Gretchen, I have a better idea. So tell everybody, just give you their address and then you mail them a cover. So I contact my publisher, he sends me hundreds of covers because they don't care. You know, what's a cover cost? Nothing. So I'll tell you, it costs a uh, dollar eight in the United States. We're outside the U.S. If you add in the envelope, the envelope's 50 cents. So it probably cost me, not counting my time, 
I don't know, two dollars and fifty cents to mail cover to someone. Of course, that's about what I make in royalties per book. So every every time I do this, I probably break even on that book. But then I require people to post a picture of them with the cover on Facebook. So when they do that, then all their friends find out, you know, Lonely Boy 15 just pasted a picture of him with enchantment. Must be something. I'm trying to get, guess what? Social proof. So it's worth me, worth it to me, three bucks per picture to get it up to get social proof. That's the thinking. Not that I had all this thinking in line, but I've evolved the thinking. Maybe I'm rationalizing. Um, one more thing. Uh, I want you to know my Resisting you is futile, okay? That's what that chicken scratch looks, this says. And the reason why I'm explaining what I'm signing is because in my previous book, Reality Check, and the book before that, The Art of the Start, I used to sign it, Kick Butt. And then one day, after I signed her book, this woman asked me, Guy, why did you sign my book, Nice Butt? <laughs> yeah. So I said, it's because it's true, lady. So. <laughs> So that's the day I decided I have to explain what I signed. And then I'll tell you a funny story built on that funny story. So I, I, I at a speech about three weeks ago in Park City, I, I gave that same explanation, right? And in the signing after the speech, this woman came up to me and she said, Guy, sign my book, Adequate Butt. <laughs> so it says resisting you is futile, okay? Not nice butt. Not kick butt, resisting you is futile. And uh, this is my last slide, some information for you. If you want a PDF of this presentation, just drop an email to gina at garage.com. We'll be happy to send you this presentation. Uh, secondly, the person who makes my slides uh, is Anna. I like to give credit to the person who made this slide presentation. It's a beautiful slide presentation. This just the data point. Slide presentation. Probably about 3,500 bucks to do this slide presentation. It started with what you saw. It's about 3,500 bucks to do this. Now you might think that's a lot of money, but not for me because you know I use this slide presentation 50, 75 times a year, right? So th this this slide presentation is to me what a cello is to Yo-Yo-Ma, right? Yo-Yo Ma doesn't say, oh, what's the cheapest cello I could find? That's his instrument of income. It makes him. This is what makes him. So I spent 3500 I spent 3500 but it cost you about 3500 to get this kind of presentation. And I think it's worth it if you make that many speeches. And the final thing is I have two special offers going on. One is the offer that if you send in your address, I'll sign the book for you. So if you're going to blog about this, uh, I would really love that you blog about this. Um, I need to get the two website addresses to you. So number one promotion is the link for where you get your cover signed. Number two promotion is uh, I have a deal with Peach Pit Press right now. Have you heard of a book called Presentation Zen by Gar Reynolds? It's, it's, I would say it's one of the top two books about presentations in the world. Uh, so it is a great book about how to make presentations by Gar Reynolds. And so right now, if anybody buys Enchantment anywhere in the world, any format, they will get a free copy of Presentation Zen. And so that deal is hard to beat. And so I need to provide you these two text links. And I figure out the cleverest way is to do this. So if you have a phone, just text the word MAC to the number 44133, and you will get a return text message with the links for the cover and the links for the free copy of presentations then uh, so that if you're going to blog about it you can tell your readers hey if you want to get a you know world's greatest deal in enchantment and presentations then this is where to go and one more thing you should know is that um, I ripped off this idea of texting a word to a number from a real estate uh, software company so what the real estate software company does is it enables real estate brokers to put up a sign. So let's say you're driving through Palo Alto, right? And you see a house that you're interested in. And there's a sign there that says, text this number to 44133. You get a return text message that says, this is a three bedroom house in Palo Alto. You know, no pool, no air conditioning. It's up for $5 million. And so I looked at that. I said, that is a very clever thing. Because 
you know, a lot of speakers, you hear a lot of speakers saying, well, if you want more information, go to GuyKawasaki.com, right? And, you know, about 2% of you would write down GuyKawasaki.com and about 0% of you would ever go visit the site. So this way, I can really give you an actionable item. You text the word Mac, you get the link back, it's on your phone, you know, much more likely that you will in fact go to those sites and remember those sites. So from just as a market tip, this is a clever way to sort of capture people. Actually, I will capture your phone number when you do this, but I'm not gonna do anything with it. But you know, there's a lot of like smart marketing from that real estate company that I copied here. So that is enchantment.